Sure. Shall we? Go for it. Let's make it happen. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Another very exciting uh, monthly stats webinar. A um, little bit different this time uh, in that uh, I do plan to cover a couple charts on the economy. Actually, we may spend about half our time talking about the economy. Um, some concern now, a lot of chatter. Maybe you've heard it from clients, family, friends uh, to varying degrees. So we do want to just kind of talk about that um, a little bit and kind of how it affects housing and is it as big of a deal as we think and you know what what's going to happen and when although that's a little hard to predict. Um, so we'll we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. And let's see. Well, obviously, guys, we're going to do our our very um, normal, very regular uh, uh, charts where we can look at buyer activity, seller activity, uh, so on and so forth. So um, should be a fun one. We're really grateful uh, you were able to join us today. Uh, so uh, let's dive in. All right, shown this one a few times without data. You're just another person with an opinion. You know, some of our, some of our uh, chat will be uh, a little bit uh, on the serious side today. Uh, so I decided, um, I thought it would be fun just to uh, have a few light notes uh, to be uh, just to begin. So a little bit of fun with pie charts, guys. Here's a first pie chart. So the blue is the sky, the kind of yellow is the sunny side of the pyramid. And then this dark brown is sort of the dark, the shadowy, shadowy, shady side of the pyramid. Anyway, what do you do when you can't hear someone? Tell them I can't hear them. Eh, move closer so I can hear. Eh repeatedly shout what? Sometimes, mostly just laugh and hope that it wasn't a question. All right, what do I do at parties? A you know, little bit of talk, a little bit more eat, but mostly think about whether it's okay to leave yet. Uh, and so you can kind of see that in red. All right, time spent when you can't sleep. A little sliver in blue, actually trying to fall asleep, but mostly it's calculating the exact amount of sleep you'll get if you fall asleep right now, right? I'll still get five and a half hours. Oh, I'll still get my six and a half hours. Found that one funny. When you text someone, I'm on my way, are you actually on your way or are you mostly still at home? I think most of us are still at home. All right, last one. Reasons why I don't let my girlfriend use my PlayStation 4? Well, partly because I don't have a girlfriend. I have a lovely wife, uh, but also I don't have a PlayStation. So kind of both of those factors are at play. Anyway, got to have some fun with pie charts, you guys. Speaking of fun with pie charts, what if I told you Stats can be fun. Would you believe me? I bet some of you wouldn't believe me, uh, but you should. So there's two options, you guys, the red pill and the blue pill. In the red pill, you've got the good, fun life with stats and charts, right? Real market intelligence, business growth opportunities, repeat buyers and sellers. On the other hand, you have the blue pill which really is an unfortunate situation without stats and charts. So a very sad, uh, very sad life uh, and, and with lots of confusion and plenty of misguided assumptions to boot. So you guys tell me, um, sometimes it's a little bit of a hurdle to get fluent and comfortable with the stats. So it's a little bit, you know, uh, of a next step, a little bit of a next level. So hence the red pill and the blue pill, we can just, you can just sort of stay where you are uh, without stats. Uh, and that's not where we, want, where we want you guys to be. All right, the market. Let's start off with a, uh, just a little bit of showings uh, data, guys. This is high level. So this is showings from uh, 2019 through 22. Uh, and you guys will see we are through, what, uh, two days ago? We are through Tuesday. So just updated this guy yesterday. So you guys can see, right, showing activity in 2022 you know, started off, decently strong, right? Ahead of 19 levels in gray, ahead of 2020 levels pre-COVID, uh, but not as high as 2021 levels, which uh, the market had really gone bonkers in the first half of 21, right? So sort of second half of 20 and first half of 21 uh, were really um, kind of the heights of the crazy times when there was a rush on housing. Uh, I call it the COVID reshuffle. You know, since then, guys, you know, you see a couple, um, let's see, holiday, looks like we got uh, Fourth of July coming up, um, you know, Memorial Day, and uh, some of the fateful events that have happened on that weekend uh, in, in the recent past. But you guys can also see, you know, look what's happened with showings this year. Um, 
you know, they went from sort of middle of the pack looking pretty decent. And then we started to really see these rate hikes, um, you know, April, May, and, you know, Fed just did three quarters of a point yesterday, a 0.75. I think some were expecting 0.5, uh, but they did 0.75 just to show how serious they are um, about combating um, four decade high inflation. So of course, 10 year treasuries respond, I think 10 years at three and a half percent, maybe three, four. Of course, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage follows that 10 year rate uh, pretty closely. So little bit less buyer activity, or excuse me, less showing activity, which usually translates into uh, less buyer activity. We're already seeing some declines, you know, in pendings and closings. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep looking at that. All right, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, the market, don't be mean, be above average. Stats, stats everywhere. All right, guys, new listings in May. So May is an interesting month to be looking at this stuff, right? Because it was really, you know, April and May 2020, where we saw that initial COVID impact. And don't forget, this is sellers. So that initial COVID impact down a little over 20%, you know, we clawed our way back 4% and then another 4.5%. But you'll notice, you know, we're not at these levels. Uh, we're not at these levels. So that's new listings. You know, this is an interesting... Um, Kind of an interesting stat here, and this is from Fannie Mae, uh, put together by the KCM folks. A majority of consumers still say it's a good time to sell, right? A little over uh, three and four, about 70, 76%. And this is April of 2020 when, you know, so we went from 67 to about 30% saying it's a good time to sell. But, you know, that recovered pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of people believe it is still a good time to sell. How about pending signed contracts down 11 and a half percent after up 16 and a half percent? So I think part of this is that some of the sales activity that would have happened this year have been drawn either earlier into this year or into last year. And also, you know, obviously rates, rates are holding some people back. Um, you know, payments went up pretty noticeably. Uh, so, you know, that's probably affecting signed contracts as well. Guys, inventory, don't forget inventory. We've had lower levels of inventory, even though we have a slight gain. Uh, it's actually our first gain in, in several years. Um, so we did see a slight gain, but inventory has been dwindling. It's been down, down, down. Even if we saw a little you know, 4% bump, um, we still have an undersupply issue. So that's still kind of playing out a little bit. Uh, but you know, let's keep watching this. Let's watch what happens June and July as we see some of the federal funds rate changes continue to trickle into the 30 year uh, fixed rate. So closings, yeah, down about two and a half, two and three quarters percent after up 18% uh, last May. You guys can see there's our 20% pullback uh, during COVID, May of 2020. Uh, and you guys can see about 5,500. So what are we consistent with 2013 levels? Uh, pretty close with 18 levels, um, but yeah, down about two and a half, three percent. CDOM, cumulative days on the market. One of my favorites, why? Well, it, it asks and answers the question, right? How long can, my, can I reasonably expect my home to linger on the market? And lately, it has been not that long, right? Not all that long. And so um, we see a lot of folks going under contract really quickly. Some folks go under contract in four hours. Some other folks could take 40 days or, or 100 days, uh, but the median sits at seven, right? Meaning median numbers half above, half below. So 50% of our deals um, were signed in under seven days and the other half of our uh, contracts were signed in over seven days. So one week folks, uh, that's still our market time. So still a, um, an absurdly fast market uh, 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 where homes are selling really quickly. Uh, you know what, let me go back for just a second. So Jackson and I and, and a few others um, talk about this sometimes. Why is this problematic when it comes to our methodology? Well, as some of you know, inventory is a snapshot at month end. It's a consistent process, a consistent methodology. It's been done this way for, uh, let's see, going back to 03, so 20 years, um, you know, and we recast that net backwards. So we always refresh historical data every time. But you know, as homes have sold, as homes have started to sell so quickly, there's a lot of listings that come on the market on say the 10th and 
based on this chart are off the market on the 17th, right? Uh, or on the 20th and off on the 27th. So guess what? Those guys won't be in active status when we take our snapshot of inventory at month end. So, you know, yes, we're showing inventory declines, you know, that's starting to change as, as we'll see uh, shortly, but it doesn't always give the true picture of, you know, what's the number of listings out there that I could write an offer on, um, you know, right now, that month end inventory snapshot doesn't always capture that. So just know that that's probably undercounting a little bit. Hard to say how much, um, but as homes continue to fly off the market, um, the likelihood of them still being active at month end is, is lower. Um, so a couple of things to just ponder there. Median sales price for the Metro uh, up about 9% guys. And we hit 375. That's a record high for us. We've never hit uh, 375. So this is May. Typically we still see gains into June, usually into July, um, sometimes August, uh, August and September uh, start to change a little bit. Just, And I'm not talking year over year, I'm talking within the year where we kind of peak usually June or July uh, before we sort of hit that seasonal, that normal, regular, healthy seasonal decline. So you'll notice this 9%, right? That was after 16.5% the year prior. Uh, you'll also probably notice that uh, 16 and nine are just about as high as we've been ever, right? Um, there were some periods, guys, there were some months. Uh, so 16, you know, I, I, nine is not bigger than uh, the 14 uh, or the 10 we've seen here, uh, but that 16 was really a strong game. I think there was one time in 2012 or 13 when we saw, um, we saw 17 and a half uh, percent flippers, investors, um, folks like that, uh, cat, you know, cash buyers uh, who kind of descended on the market after these declines, right? A lot of cash on the market, a lot of demand uh, pouring in, you know, when supply wasn't plentiful, there was more of it then than now. Uh, and so that really shoved prices higher. All right, median sales price, guys. I don't always, as I say, I don't always love showing a table of numbers, uh, but I am doing that right now, uh, just because it, it, it it's a different way to sort of look at it and visualize it. So look at May of last year. We had a year over year uh, uh, price growth of 16.6%. We just saw that, right? Now into March of this year, right? Okay, we're more like 8%. Well, my spidey math tells me 8% is just about half of the 16%. So prices were rising at less than half the rate than they were uh, about a year ago. And then we kind of touched 10%. So guys, price growth has decelerated. Prices have not declined. Price growth has decelerated, but home prices are not falling. Um, so you might have clients that ask you, oh, I heard prices are falling. Well, the rate of price growth is down and is starting to come in line with historical you know, his sort of historical averages, we're not there yet. Uh, but no, they haven't declined, but the price growth is slowing. And that's a good, healthy thing. Let's throw in May. So just last month, you guys, um, we showed that 9%. We just saw that also in our green uh, median sales price chart. So, you know, we're kind of bouncing around, you know, 8, 9, 10, 8, 8, 10, 9, you know, better than the 14, 12, and 16% that we saw um, last year around this time. So something else to consider. All right, one of my favorites, a uh, percentage of original list price received at the time of sale. So if I'm asking, if I'm asking 300,000 on my house and I accept 315, I've just accepted 105% of my list price. If I'm asking 400,000 on my house and I accept 360, I've just accepted 90% of my list price, right? So it's kind of how the math works. Um, you know, a couple, Actually, a couple of really interesting observations here. So first, heading into 19 and even, well, I suppose May of 2020, a unique time, but you know, even May of 2019, we did start to see this softening a little bit. Remember, rates did go up end of 2018, kind of into early 19. So I'm not sure if that's directly caused by that, uh, but just know that we did kind of trickle uh, a little bit lower um, into 2019. And then boom, right? All of a sudden, we were at 104% uh, after COVID, sort of uh, in that the COVID reshuffle uh, of late 2020 and early uh, 21. But you guys, it's holding, right? It's holding. And we actually were up a tenth of a percent to 104.1% 
of original list price. That's how much sellers are receiving on average of their original list price. So they're getting 100% of their original list price plus four and a tenth percent. Pretty astonishing still. So, you know, not really many immediate signs of weakness here, right? In fact, we still see strengthening. Not a ton of strengthening. I guess I'd call that flat. But we don't have clear evidence of, of weakening here. Um, so that's interesting. Here's our bump, you guys, nine and a quarter. Um, it, this is May inventory. So this is May of every year going back to 03. <laughs> How many of you knew we had 36,000 active listings uh, around the middle of 2007? 36,000. Unbelievable. Uh, we have 7,000 uh, as of the end of last month. And like I said, that's about a 9% increase. Now, something else interesting, you guys, and for this, I better get my laser. Actually, I'm going to get my pen. Ooh, this will be exciting. So check this out, guys. Hey, oh, the pen does work. Okay. So look, you guys, um, from 10.7, you know, to 7 flat, we should have stopped at 8.5, right? We should have stopped here at 8.5, but we didn't. So without COVID, I think this would have been a more normal decline. But instead, we were down 40 and then up nine. And now suddenly everything got very messy. How do I clear this? <laughs> clear, clear. Where's my clear? Why can't I clear this stuff? Eraser, okay. Oh, wow, one by one? Okay, that's how we're gonna do it. Sounds good. Anyway, guys, so back to my laser, enough with the drawing. Um, you know, guys, if, if this was the trend, this is an outlier. So this should have been down what? You know, 20% to get from 10.7 to say eight flat or eight five or whatever it is. Uh, and then we touch seven. So instead of that, we did down 40%. So then we had to kind of be up 9%. Um, you know, whether this is the beginning of a trend, it could be. Um, I think there's more likelihood that it is the beginning of a trend as we see demand cool off a bit, but we don't see sellers, you know, rushing to get on market. Um, we saw a little bit of an increase, but we're still much lower compared to sort of pre-COVID levels. So you know, is this good news for buyers? You know, sure. Um, they've got more options than they did the year prior, but the trend uh, is not exactly their friend. Um, so, you know, still tough. There are still homes out there. There are still thousands of sales that happen each month. Uh, people are still buying and selling homes as they will, no matter what rates in the economy do, recession or not. Um, the market has to move, you guys. Now, could there be a few? Uh, uh, could there be a few less buyers? Could there be less buyers? Yeah, there could be. Um, and could inventory continue to grow? Yeah, it could. Uh, and, and yet, there still is churn in the market. So um, we just hear a lot of doom and gloom nowadays. And you know, while while I have some concerns, I, I don't feel like the sky is falling. I feel like we're rebalancing and that rates are normalizing a little bit. And we'll talk more about that. Month supply, 20%. Wow, 1.1 to 1.3. What do we know about 1.3? It is still an extreme seller's market, right? Sellers still have the power. They're still holding the reins and holding the steering wheel. So we're still shooting for five to six. You know, some say four to six or even four to seven pretty broadly um, is a relatively balanced market. So we are nowhere near five, you guys. Uh, we're nowhere near five. We've got a long ways to go before we're even in a balanced market, right? So until, as long as we're this undersupplied, as undersupplied as we are, it's pretty difficult to see home prices softening. Not a guarantee, it's possible that they do, um, but just given, you know, given these figures, and don't forget the, that ratio of sold to list, market times, and these absorption rates or month supply, um, you know, those are showing some signs of change. They're not tell, they're not screaming that the earth is, uh, 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 that the world is ending. They're just not screaming that yet. I'm not sure they will. All right. The economy guys, let's shift gears. Um, I, I want to spend a lot of time kind of talking about this. So did we mention it's the economy? All right. Unemployment rate for 16 plus folks. We're at about three and a half percent. You guys can see going all the way back to 1990. Um, kind of interesting to see a little bit of the business cycle here, right? Kind of, um, you know, tightening and expansion and tightening and expansion. And then enter COVID, right? 
So, you know, as some of the, uh, you know, as with some of the changes that we saw with businesses and the economy and, and workers, um, we saw unemployment skyrocket uh, to 15%. We don't have the historical data going back that far. Uh, sorry, on this chart, others do. The data does go back much further. Um, it's hard to say. I, I, I'm not sure if this would be close to that um, you know, early 80s level uh, or uh, what the 1920s uh, you know, depression era. I think depression was higher. I think it was closer to 20, but don't quote me on that. I'll, I'll have to look. Um, so guys, we've come all the way back down, right? We're pretty even with pre-COVID levels. So, you know, the unemployment rate is just about at an all-time low, you know, maybe up and down, maybe three, four, three, six, right? Three, five. Um, so we're just about back to all-time lows. The the labor market, right? Um, the labor market is tight. The job market is tight. There are more job openings than there are workers. So businesses, guys, they're still growing. Um, retail sales are strong. Uh, consumers are in a pretty good financial position and they're spending money, right? They're buying stuff. In fact, they're buying too much stuff. And that's why, you know, uh, higher rates might cool off some of that buying uh, and some of that borrowing. So um, interesting stuff. Unemployment rate for large metro areas. This is as of April, so we don't quite have uh, May data yet. Obviously not June data. Month is not done. Who's in first place? It's us. You got that right. Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, MSA has the lowest unemployment rate of any major metropolitan area. Let me say it again. Our Twin Cities region right here, the one we're in, has the lowest unemployment rate of any major metropolitan area across our great union, right? Who's after us? Looks like Birmingham, Indianapolis, Salt Lake. And then we get into our, some of our California areas down to Tampa and Atlanta, and then Austin making an appearance, uh, followed by Nashville and OKC. Uh, so um, like it or not, you guys, believe it or not, um, we have uh, the most competitive labor market, one of the tightest labor markets, in fact, the tightest labor market uh, that we've seen. So in addition uh, to um, the unemployment rate, it's important to look at unemployment claims. Now, leading indicator, you guys, right? Claims typically tend to turn into unemployment and unemployment tend to turn into claims. So they're related. You know, we see a very similar story kind of back to all time lows. Maybe we see a little bit of a tick here, but no, you know, we've seen these little upticks before. Um, we'll have to wait and see if this trend is confirmed. We don't have that confirmation yet, but this is worth watching. All right, employment to population ratio. So I have, um, let's say I've got, 80 workers, but my population is out of 100 people. Well, those 80 workers out of 100 people, it's about an 80% uh, employment to population ratio. So you guys can see this, this indicator actually peaked um, in about 2000, in 99, 2000, with you know, that huge expansion that we saw throughout the 90s. Uh, enter 2000 and the, uh, remember that dot-com bubble bursting? That was a recession. Remember the great mortgage crisis and the housing bubble? That was a recession. Uh, there's COVID. That was a short-lived, you know, quick recession, but a recession nonetheless. So starting in 2000, we really saw, um, you know, the employment to population ratio decline. A little bit of recovery, uh, and then we went even further down, uh, hitting 75%, uh, you know, after the recession, after the great recession. Starting in 2010, 2012, uh, we started to climb our way up. Uh, by 2017, trend is the same, you guys, right? The trend has not really changed uh, from 2011 through 2020. It's been fairly linear. And then uh, we sort of uh, dumped off, right? We sort of uh, melted down a little bit, but we've come up more or less just as quickly, right? So this does appear to be sort of a V-shaped phenomenon, not one of these long you know, protracted U-shaped recovery. So that's important, guys. Kind of a wider U-shaped recovery versus a V-shaped recovery. And this changes metric to metric, uh, sort of the shape of the recovery, uh, if you will. How about our 65 plus friends and family? Are these guys working? What's their deal? Are they retiring? Are they downsizing? Um, people call this the silver tsunami. I love that term, the silver tsunami. Uh, the wave of, or the tsunami really of um, 
uh, some of our seniors and, and baby boomers who are you know, looking at retirement, looking at drawing on Social Security, Medicare, so on and so forth. So 6.6% uh, of 65 plus of the 65 plus cohort are employed, right? That's the highest level we've seen since the late 40s, right? That's pretty incredible. Now, a couple things to think about. We're living longer, right? So that means we're working longer. Um, Social Security has not kept up with the cost of living. They just did a COLA, right? A cost of living adjustment. They just did a COLA, uh, was that this year or last? I think it was this year. So, you know, that's starting to reflect the impact of rising costs and rising prices. Uh, but, you know, this has really been a trend since 2000, right? So it's not like the 65 plus folks, you know, well, they have seen a chunk of their, uh, you know, unfortunately a chunk of their retirement nest egg if it was invested in stocks, they have seen maybe 15 or 20% of it um, go down for now. If you're 65 plus, you had better not be mostly invested in stocks, right? You should be more in fixed income assets and safer, much safer, lower risk assets. Um, yeah, that's, that's where you should be. Uh, this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. These opinions are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Mar. So really since 2000, you guys, we started to see um, 65 plus folks kind of come back into the labor force. How about household net worth as a percentage of our GDP? Um, so based on this uh, Federal Reserve flow of funds uh, report assembled by um, my friend Bill McBride at Calculated Risk, uh, this is as high as it's been since at least 1950, likely earlier, right? Households are now worth six times our national GDP, right? Six times GDP. And look at when so much of that happened, right? It was pretty recently. Housing equity. Until recently, right? Stocks were, you know, reached an all-time high, uh, what, you know, end of last year. Uh, what else? Um, household net worth, what else is driving that, you guys? Uh, you know, income, we weren't spending, we weren't traveling, we weren't going out to eat and, and out to drink and out to sports games, right? So we were saving money. And then the stimmy checks, right? The stimulus checks, uh, you know, direct government uh, payouts. Last administration did some, this administration did some. So it's not a left versus right thing. Uh, it, 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 you know, looking back, you guys, uh, you know, the Fed was trying, the Fed and our policy uh, makers were really trying to, we weren't sure if we were staring off the cliff of a depression, right? When COVID hit, we just really weren't sure it hasn't happened. So it makes sense that we would kind of fire all of our, all of our ammo, you know, trying to address that and kind of get ahead of it. However, maybe we fired too much ammo and there's a little bit too much money swirling around out there chasing too few goods. And that's why we're seeing inflation. In fact, I know it is, right? Uh, so, guys, you know, household net worth has never been so high, at least since 1950. Um, that's encouraging. How about economic growth? GDP, percent change in gross domestic product, uh, percent change uh, on previous quarter. So <laughs> look at the meltdown, right? The worst meltdown since at least 1940. Uh, GDP down 30% and then up 30%, right? So we had that COVID meltdown, and then we kind of had that recovery that was Pretty, pretty quick, but wow, what a gyration, right? What a decline and what an increase. Something else you'll notice. I don't know why I keep messing around with my pen. I never really used to do that, but here we are. Something else you'll notice. Oh, shoot. What about when I get to the end of my mouse pad? That was kind of tricky. Um, something else you'll notice, you guys, right? The, the rate of growth has been declining, um, right? Since the 50s. That's when we had this huge post-war expansion. Um, don't forget a little bit of stagflation in the 70s. You guys can kind of see that. Don't forget the early 80s, hyperinflation in the early 80s. By the way, that's what we're comparing uh, today's inflation, the current inflation rate to is this period. Uh, great recession. Remember the great recession, the housing crisis? That's what, looked, uh, that's what that looked like. Dot-com bubble bursting, pretty small, right? A couple quarters of pretty modest declines. Um, and yet, you know, it was, it was a decline. How about GDP, um, uh, you know, a quarterly change. So a little more current, you guys. There's our big COVID decline. There's our sort of recovery. And, and this is a quarterly level, right? This is at the quarterly scale. 
So we were down four tenths of a percent in the first quarter. I'm not sure how many are aware of that, but it's a thing that happened. Now, it's mostly explainable by uh, more imported goods, fading stimulus and rising inventories where businesses were just trying to catch up to demand. So they had all this inventory buildup and it wasn't all sold, right? So um, some of that is a factor. You know, another, another consideration with this minus four, uh, sorry, uh, minus 0.4 is a recession is defined by two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. It's possible we're halfway through our recession. It's possible that the second quarter of this year also has um, a decline. We haven't seen second quarter data, have we? No, because it's January, January, February, March. Yeah, June. Yeah, so second quarter ends. So when we see second quarter data in July, I believe, um, people will be watching this, including um, market participants, traders, uh, and, and Wall Street will be watching this closely. So guys, it's possible that we're halfway through the recession that everybody you know, is, is kind of uh, uh, yelling about. Um, not a guarantee, no one's sure, it's possible. It's possible it will go further than just two quarters, right? So anybody who claims they know the answers to these things is simply lying to you, don't believe it. Oops, went a little too fast there. Uh, GDP, you guys. We're at about 24 and a half trillion, which is a lot, sounds like a lot. Isn't as much when you consider the fact that we're 30 trillion in debt now. Um, so um, some concerns there. Kind of see what happened in 08, right? Great recession. Uh, kind of see what happened with COVID, right? The, the COVID recession here. And then, you know, we've continued uh, our ascent. So, you know, this is a pretty long, you know, pretty high level view, pretty 30,000 foot view. Uh, but kind of gives us a sense of the long-term trend. Okay. Household real estate value as a percent of GDP here in blue. Excuse me, just about at all-time highs with uh, tied up with 06, right? Kind of peak of the bubble. But look at mortgage debt as a percent of GDP. This one's fascinating. Uh, yeah, COVID, uh, kind of interesting, some refis there. So... What's driving this? Well, owners aren't taking equity out of their homes. Boomers are paying off their loans. GDP has only been growing, right? So it's a smaller share because the denominator has been growing. Uh, and, 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 you know, some folks are still making additional principal payments, you know, a lot, not everybody. So mortgage debt is up, right? Mortgage debt is up. The amount of it is up, but not as a percent of GDP. Fascinating. Uh, so I think I've shown this for the last few webinars. I want to pull it forward into today. Um, so this is third quarter last year, a little bit dated. Please forgive me. I just haven't been able to find a more updated one uh, from our friends at CoreLogic. Um, then again, I must admit, it's been maybe a month since I've looked, so I, I better check again. Uh, 33,000, you guys, uh, the typical homeowner of, say, uh, the owner of the median priced home uh, uh, year over year from uh, in the third. So from Q3 2020 into Q3 21, that typical homeowner gained $33,000 in wealth and housing wealth and in, in home equity. Seems like a lot, sounds like a lot. $33,000 is a lot, but it's only really 10% price growth on a $330,000 home. So that's roughly what our median was at that time, right? 330, 340. So 10% growth on 330,000, boom, there's your 33 grand. Um, you know, we're not quite at levels like we see uh, in some of our uh, mountain states and out on the West Coast. I'm still kind of upset that our Hoosiers, uh, those Hoosiers have beat us in Indiana. I just don't get it. All right, guys, let's talk. Um, so I'm going to show some words now uh, and, and uh, I'm going to read some of them. So forgive me. I hate reading words on screen, but we just have to talk about some of this. So uh, demand for goods has absolutely skyrocketed, right? Demand for services, not as much, right? So there's a shortage of the supply of goods that are being, you know, that are in such strong demand. COVID has caused that. Supply chain bottlenecks has caused that. Energy, rising energy costs have caused that. Uh, shipping, uh, you know, shipping challenges. Uh, China's lockdown in Shanghai um, has also been, you know, a factor driving that. So 
Um, lots of different factors that are sort of moving the needle on that, um, to be sure. So really, guys, inflation isn't complicated. Um, if you ask the Fed, it's going to be complicated to solve or, or to address, but really, it's too many dollars chasing too few goods. There's too much money swirling out in the economy and not enough places to spend it, not enough goods um, uh, to spend it on. And so not unlike housing, when you have a lot of demand for housing and not a lot of supply, prices rise, you guys. It, it's really not any different. So don't overthink it. Um, you know, People are asking, where should I lay the blame? Well, both the last and the current administration have handed out money. Like it or not, right? Uh, and, and don't forget, you know, student loans have been paused. So even more money uh, in people's hands that aren't, uh, that's not going out the door. Oh, what's this about? Oh, do you guys remember way back in the day when they used to have the free air um, at the gas stations, at the Shell station and the speedways, quick trips and super Americas and everyone, everyone had the free air. Now it's like a buck 50. Do you know why? Inflation. <laughs> that was good. Okay. Inflation, guys. Let's talk. All right. So first things first, look at retail and food services. Look at retail sales. And these are just excluding gasoline. So just excluding gas here. Retail and food service. There's your COVID. Uh, there's your March, April 2020. Uh, there's your brief COVID recession. Look at what's happened since, guys. This really tells a story. This this tells um, this really tells a story. So let's just bear with me. Let's just try to kind of draw this. If this trend had continued, we would be here, right? Look at this long term trend. Oops, it's a little. It's kind of hard to do this, you guys. Okay, look at this long term, fairly linear trend, right? Kind of same thing here. Oh, that's the key. Just go fast. All right. That's always the key. All right. So um, look at this, guys. Uh, we we should be here if the trend continued. Instead, we are here. Why? Everybody's buying stuff, right? We we uh, everybody's buying stuff. It, it's just it's just what we're doing. So we see all this demand for goods, right? Retail and food services, uh, you know, well above where it should be. Were the trend to continue. And that extra demand, that excess demand for goods is coming at a time when, due to all the factors that we just saw on the previous slide, it's at a time when the supply of those goods is down, right? COVID interrupted our labor, our labor force, right? Um, shutdowns, uh, China lockdowns. We just saw it, guys. Supply bottleneck, shipping costs, you name it. Um, so more demand for goods, less supply of those goods the price of goods goes higher. I know, right? Who would have thunk? All right, so, you know, kind of put another way, um, th this one's not that exciting, honestly, except they've done the done me the, uh, the, the service of dr drawing my trend line for me. So this is the regression through 07 and extrapolated. If we continued as we were, I'm um, kind of heading into 06, 07, that's where we'd be. But if you really look at retail and food services overall, so not stopping in 07, but overall, that's where we'd be. But again, you'll notice we are well above that. Uh, this is a pretty pretty basic chart. Uh, recent uh, monthly retail sales, guys. So, so May, um, the consumer is holding up so far, right? Consumption is holding up so far. Uh, let's see if that changes. Um, you know, people are having to make sacrifices. We're spending more on gas and food. So maybe we're not going to buy that whimsical, you know, I don't want to say luxury item, but that, you know, that that it would be nice to have because we're spending more on we must have. So we're going to be spending a little bit less on it would be nice stuff because we're spending it on we need it stuff. Um, I don't I don't see a decline, right? The data isn't showing a decline uh, in this indicator yet. Um, Again, we're going to keep watching it. Industrial production, along with recessions, I won't spend a ton of time here, guys, but notice that COVID recession here um, brought us down. We've come all the way back up, and without having the raw data, it does appear we're at an all-time high. Now, uh, you know, office space has been a little weak on the non-residential side. Office space has been weak with work from home. Retail has been weak. Even though retail sales are up, the retail... Um, 
the retail uh, real estate market is down because we're buying more online, right? We're buying more online and, and, and it's just shipped to us, either Amazon or, or, or elsewhere. Uh, so, you know, industrial is hot. Retail and office space kind of cold, uh, or I should say cooled a little bit. Uh, but wow, industrial and warehouse space is just on a tear. And this kind of shows why industrial production up, right? Up. Total public debt. Uh, this is not a happy one. Should we skip this one? There we are, guys, about 30 and a half trillion uh, as of uh, the first quarter of this year. You guys will notice, right? We've been fairly linear um, since the Great Recession, uh, kind of, uh, you know, 06, 07. We've been fairly linear here, uh, you know, all the way through 2020, you guys, right? This is through multiple administrations. Uh, we've been fairly linear with our debt accumulation until all of a sudden we weren't, right? And all of a sudden uh, things changed. Uh, forgive my drawings, um, still experimenting with that. Can't I just clear them all? I really thought there was a way to just clear all drawings. Anyway, all right. There we go. Okay, erase all ink. There we go. So guys, you can see what happened to that national debt. Uh, unfortunately, um, with COVID, we we there were you know it was unprecedented levels of um, it was an unprecedented attempt to sort of rescue the economy and prevent uh, uh, further uh, further downfall. Which personally, I believe it accomplished that. Right. I think it would have been worse were it not for some of this, um, some of the spending, some of the uh, government spending that we did. Do I think we did a little bit too much? Maybe, maybe a little bit too much, um, but you know, hindsight is 2020. Well, <laughs> hindsight is 2022. Um, anyway, funny time for uh, hindsight jokes. Federal surplus or deficit, you guys, as we run deficits that turns into debt. Last time we had a, 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 a fiscal surplus, right? where we took in more than we spent was in the late 90s, right? Uh, so we handed uh, over a, uh, a, a surplus. We actually had a surplus of money. Looks like in uh, what, 0203, we started to see that come down where our deficit increased uh, in 05, 06, or sorry, uh, about 07, 08, we saw that decline even more. Starting in 08 and 2010, we actually saw that deficit get smaller. So the deficit shrank, right? And then in about 2015, 2016, we actually see the deficit growing again. And then, you know, you can kind of see, you know, this COVID uh, thing. Uh, and then we're kind of back, um, back here a little bit. So obviously, you know, COVID changed the game on, uh, you know, deficit spending. Daily trends, COVID-19 deaths. Guys, you probably haven't seen this chart in a while. I haven't focused on it in a long time. I'm encouraged to see these levels. Um, I don't think we're done yet. Uh, who knows what other variants could be mutating as I speak right now. Uh, but you can kind of see the, you know, the three waves, uh, that kind of first wave, uh, what, Delta, and then uh, maybe wave one and wave two of Omicron, or is this Omicron A and Omicron B, something like that. Uh, but again, you guys, it's nice to see us down here, you know, pretty much, you know, at the lows that we saw previously. But then again, there was another variant. What am I reading now? Monkey pox? Are we all going to get monkey pox? My God, what's happening? Uh, so, um, you know, I'm somewhat encouraged by this, although, um, did Fauci just get uh, COVID? I think he did. Uh, and, and a couple other folks, uh, you know, Folks who have been really careful for the whole time, right, for years, uh, just seem to be getting it now. But the cases seem to be less uh, less severe. Um, yeah, the cases seem to be less severe. Consumer sentiment. How are consumers feeling? Well, not good. <laughs> right? They are not feeling great. Uh, consumer confidence or uh, consumer sentiment is just about as low as it was um, during that hyperinflation period of the early 80s, right? No surprise, inflation is pretty much tied with where it was then. Uh, consumer confidence cratered, you know, heading into 07, 08, into the Great Recession. It recovered from, you know, what, 09 through 20, you know, 17-ish, uh, and then really kind of flattened out in, uh, what, in 18 and 19, uh, really started to flatten out, actually even come down. Uh, and then COVID obviously did this little bit of a recovery before we really started to see uh, the impact on inflation and fuel prices. 
All right, small business optimism, similar story, you guys, I guess not quite as low as they were uh, in uh, what, uh, oh, 08, 09, uh, and kind of before 10 there. Uh, oops, sorry, guys, so it looks like this is on the line. So this is what, 8, 9, and 10. Now I have a lot of lines. Uh, so, you know, here we are. Uh, so yes, above that level, but it will also tied with levels during that 1991 recession, that early 90s recession. Uh, looks like we hit just about all time highs, right? We were on the way up, on the way up. Um, you know, li little dip here. I don't know. Was that election jitters? I know that was a uh, interesting election time. I don't know. I I don't think so. Maybe had a little bit more to do with the rate environment or or just growth. Not sure. We'd have to look at that. Interesting data. TSA checkpoints, right? Look at 2022 here in red, uh, compared to uh, 2019 here in light blue. Uh, look at 2020. Wow. TSA checkpoints. Pretty interesting. Uh, 2021 started off in a pretty rough place, but actually ended, you know, within 70% of normal levels. Uh, so, you know, guys, are, are we traveling again? A little bit, you know, if you look at 2022, um, pretty close, not 2019 levels, but well ahead of 21 and 20. So some evidence, you know, this is considering getting back toward a level of normalcy. Movie sales, interesting. Uh, wait a second. Uh, no, okay, yeah, this is right. Okay, uh, so 2022 movie sales, box office sales, pretty interesting, guys. This is million, so this is 300 million uh, weekly, weekly movie sales, 300 million that week. So look at 2020, right? Way down, whoa, what happened there? Uh, way, way down. Uh, end of 21, right? Uh, heading into the uh, holiday season uh, at the end of last year, actually, I guess people were feeling kind of good. Uh, and then so far uh, this year in 2022, I, I guess I do see a little bit of an increase. Uh, and it looks like we're actually uh, pretty much in line with that 2016 through 19 median. Guys, movie sales are not the economy and the economy is not movie sales. But when people are feeling, you know, confident going out, they have a little bit, you know, they have a few extra discretionary dollars in their pocket. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're going out and they're spending it uh, on discretionary services. Hotel occupancy, look at 2020. Wow. Why does it keep doing that? Wow, wow, wow. And then 21, you know, a little bit better. Uh, there's our median here in blue. And look at 22, guys, we're pretty much on track with that median. I guess, if anything, a little bit above it. Have you guys heard of this thing called revenge travel? People have felt locked down for so long that they're finally unleashing some of the uh, their travel budget and uh, uh, some some wanderlust, if you will, uh, and they're doing this thing called revenge travel. I, I didn't know that was a thing. I haven't done any revenge travel myself, but I'd consider it. Time check, guys. All right, we're at 255. I'm going to speed through a couple of these um, top line contributors contributors to inflation uh, and and then core CPI. So you guys can see, right? It was at the end of 2020 we really started to kind of ramp up. This is not, you know, a super super recent. It's a relatively recent phenomenon, but it has been kind of heading up for some time. You guys can see energy in there, uh, services excluding food and energy, and then there's goods. And then there's the actual, you know, food uh, inflation. So you guys can kind of see this. To go back to what, 08 through 2019 levels of about 2% inflation, we didn't know how good we had it, right? We did not know how good we had it. Um, hindsight is perfect. All right, consumer price index for urban consumers, used cars and trucks, my goodness, 45%. Used car and truck inflation. Now that's come down to 16% now, year over year percent change, right? So that's come down. So those of you who have waited to uh, buy that uh, vehicle, uh, I, I think I think you'll be a little bit rewarded for that. But remember, these gains haven't totally gone away. Right? They haven't totally gone away. Um, so they're still a little bit uh, factored in. Airline fares, also nearly 40%, right? Turns out jet fuel is fuel, right? And requires some pretty heavy refining. So that comes with extra costs and then the cost of transporting it and you know everything else that comes along with, uh, with airfare. And that's a lot of things. Buying conditions, Univer yeah, University of Michigan sentiment survey again. So consumer confidence, vehicles, houses, and then you know what they call household durables. So appliances, you know, durable goods, uh, longer lasting goods. 
Uh, well, so houses just about lowest level because of what's happened with mortgage rates, uh, just about lowest level since the early 80s. Uh, but it looks like um, large household durables, you know, well, actually, looks like large household durables are actually even lower than they were uh, at that time. Uh, so, you know, I, I, this has so much to do with rates, you guys, and just how far they've moved and how quickly they've moved uh, is really kind of uh, making folks, uh, you know, sour a little bit. However, people are still buying homes. Mortgage rates are still below average, uh, you know, and, and we're still only spending th about three and a quarter times our income, times the median income uh, to get a house. And a lot of our other regions that that we compete with for dollars, for goods, for, you know, corporate locations, you name it. Um, you know, a lot of those guys are four, five, six, or 10 times income. So a couple things to think about. Uh, consumer sentiment, consumer confidence, and by the way, presidential approval ratings are very closely tied to gas prices, right? Guys, where inflation isn't, isn't. Look at gas and airfare, transportation, hotels, energy, vehicles, right? There's our overall at 8.6. Uh, IT and hardware, good time to make that investment, right? It's actually gotten cheaper. Toys actually cheaper. Um, or sorry, I misread that, you guys. Uh, services, uh, wait a second. IT, hardware, and services. Is that all this one? So then are toys 0.6? Well, either way, I'm buying toys nowadays. I've got two rugrats at home. And so uh, I am encouraged by that. Another way to look at it, right? Fuel oil, gas, you know, airfare, Nat gas, uh, cars and trucks, and then kind of different kinds of food, you know, dairy versus meat, poultry. Um, here we are in a housing market update, and I'm talking about food and poultry prices. How do you like that? What an amazing time we live in. Guys, something that is a little bit concerning to me, and frankly, um, this may have more to do with, uh, uh, you know, capital markets, equity markets. Look at the change in inventory versus the change in sales. So there's a saying that generals fight the last war, right? All the lessons that they've learned for this war were all gained in the last war or the last battle. So we see these companies, right? All these companies, some of the top companies uh, in, in, our, in our nation here, we see them trying to catch up. They've been trying to catch up. They couldn't supply, they couldn't um, uh, fuel all this demand that they've seen. So finally, you know, their inventories are starting to catch up a little bit. So look at the inventory growth. Look at the inventory growth, but now look at sales growth. Interesting. So the pendulum overswings, doesn't it? So we had such a shortage that companies were, you know, I mean, looking at their supply chains, they're looking at their ordering, everything, and they're really trying to get more product. Well, finally, that inventory is starting to arrive. But is it arriving at a time when demand is softening a little bit? Maybe. Interesting. Some nifty math, when you actually strip out of the consumer price index, all the items linked to energy, right? Airfare, freight, cars, delivery, vehicles, the core was actually only plus 0.36 in year over year, um, you know, about 4%. So, um, you know, less than half of the sort of headline or top line figure. So uh, Michelle Mish here uh, is saying, you know, the point is not that easy money has been a mistake. The point is that reversing the course of inflation by raising rates if mainly due to supply side constraints, won't really help. Uh, so I, I thought that was a really interesting observation as well. Guys, I know we're really close to time here. In fact, we're pretty much at time. So I'm not gonna read all of these. You know, just know housing and shelter, a huge element driving inflation higher. Uh, you know, let me say this though, guys, housing, we buy a house, what? It used to be five to seven years. Now it's more like eight or nine. So that's not an everyday consumable good. How about a vehicle? It's not really an everyday consumed good. Um, you know, gas and food are everyday expenses, but you know, some of the other things driving inflation um, aren't everyday consumables. They're they're just a lot less frequent. Um, so you know, like it or not, inflation's here. You know, we've been using the word transitory. I don't know what that means. Is that six months, a year, two years? Who knows? Have we peaked out? No, we haven't. Uh, we went from what, 8.4 to 8.6 or so. Uh, could 8.6 be the peak? It's possible. Uh, but just know, you guys, it's not just fuel. Everything's transported by fuel. So energy is really kind of um, rippling through, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of different elements here. So whose fault and does it matter? A little bit of the last administration, a little bit of the current administration, a little bit Putin, a little bit COVID, a lot of bit Fed. 
uh, but so much of it is just tied up in supply and demand. It, ultimately, it is um, one of the biggest factors, easily the biggest dynamic that's kind of impacting this. So with that, I will say uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for hanging in. I know that was a lot of data toward the end. Um, about half and half, guys, about half on housing, half on the economy. Um, I also want to say I'm not an economist. I'm just interpreting data. Uh, so, you know, take some of this with a grain of salt. Um, you guys will get the slide deck so you can spend a little bit more time with it. And just know the economy affects housing. Housing affects the economy. These things are interrelated, but also know I do not believe the sky is falling. Um, I just don't. Uh, but let's watch during the coming months to see, to see what happens to the market uh, and to the economy. And with that, I want to say thanks again and flip it back to Jackson. Well, thank you, David. This has been a wonderful hour, really enlightening stuff. Uh, I hope everyone, um, you know, took in as much as you could from that hour. Uh, if you do uh, need a, a quick recap between now and our next monthly webinar, this will be available on YouTube. I will send that link to you uh, in the coming days. In the meantime, uh, if you want to sign up for our next monthly webinar on July 21st uh, at 2 p.m., I put the link in the chat. Feel free to click on that link and register right now before you forget. And until next time, we'll see you. Thanks, everyone.